Um, but for those of you just joining us, Megan Brashear um, graduated from Brigham Young University in 2000 with a BS in animal science and an emphasis in veterinary technology. She earned her CVT uh, in Oregon in 2000 and in 2004 became a veterinary technician specialist in emergency and critical care. She is currently the specialty technician trainer at VCA Northwest Veterinary Specialist in Clackamas, Oregon, uh, where she enjoys mentoring and training technicians on the hospital floor. She enjoys traveling and lecturing to nurses around the world and exploring her home and uh, state with her crazy German short-haired pointer. If I can remind everybody, please, we do need to be in a chair per the Orlando Fire Department. Um, please make sure your phones are on silent and no photography or video recording of this session. There's always and, chairs up front, guys. Yeah, I'll help you find seats. Um, everyone, help me please <laughs> welcome Megan. All right, thank you. All right. How can we talk about shock in 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. um, there are some amazing speakers talking for an hour long about shock. And I looked at that, and Jeff Backus is one of them. And I have co-lectured with him before, and he's really great. And I'm like, what can I offer in 15 minutes that Jeff's not going to do a great job with in 60 minutes? So we're going to go through case studies, because that's all I really care about anyway, is let's talk about these animals. So. I just want to blitz through the clinical signs of shock so that we remember what those are so that we can recognize it in our patients. So this down here is the key that the clinical signs that we see often mean that our patient is compensating. So the body responds to a lack of oxygen. So for whatever reason, the animal's been vomiting, had diarrhea for two weeks, it's been hit by a car and it's bleeding somewhere, it has a splenic mass and it's bleeding somewhere, it's a cat and it refused to tell you that it was sick and it's been hiding under the bed for three weeks. These are going to cause this patient to not be circulating blood the way they normally would because they don't have enough of it, because their heart doesn't work, for whatever reason, their cells are not getting oxygen, so this is what happens. They vasoconstrict, they circle the wagons, I wanna keep my heart, my lungs, and my brain full of oxygen, and everything else just kind of drops off. The heart rate increases as the heart goes, hmm, I'm not getting blood flow out, so I'm just gonna go faster, so we'll see high heart rates, bounding pulses, when you feel those femoral pulses and the artery comes up and gives you a high five and disappears right away, that means blood is slamming through those arteries. Bright mucous membranes, eventually they're gonna to get to the point where they're gray, pale, because they vasoconstricted. At the very beginning, they're gonna be bright, and then they're gonna go down to a, a gray, white color. Fast capillary refill time, soon going down to slow capillary refill time, and then they oftentimes will have proper mentation until the brain starts to not get good blood flow, and then we'll see decreased mentation. But these mean the animal is compensating. Okay, so let's talk about this five-year-old male neutered Bernese Mountain Dog. He was fine last night, right? Everyone's fine the night before. So these people woke up um, about four in the morning and there was diarrhea all over their house. So if you can imagine a Bernese Mountain Dog having bloody diarrhea all over your house, Okay, so this dog was fine the night before, I believe them. He did steal a ham sandwich off the counter and these people were so fixated on the ham sandwich caused this, and maybe it did. So he comes in with a temp of 96.2, heart rate of 130, respiratory rate of 24, blood pressure of 162, and a dull and depressed mentation. What did I just get finished saying about clinical signs of shock? Is this dog in shock? Ooh, I love you guys. Why do you say that? His heart rate's 130. Now, that's fast for a Bernese Mountain Dog, but that's not like 150, 160. Why do you think this dog's in shock? Temperature. Temperature's really low, which tells me he's not getting good perfusion, right? He's like trying to suck all that into his heart, his lungs, and his brain, so his body temperature's low, but his heart rate's okay. His blood pressure's high. Why is that? It should be low, right? If he's not circulating blood very well, if he's got bounding pulses, his blood pressure should be low. Yet, he's having diarrhea everywhere, meaning he's losing all of his fluids. This was a super exciting case. So, this dog is in shock. He's in hypovolemic shock but there's something else going on with him. So just keep that in the back of your head. I love to talk about patients who have a disease process that don't present the way they should. There should be bells going off in your head. When this dog comes in and the owners are like, we're gonna have to burn our house down, there's so much diarrhea in it. And you're like, wait, I expect his heart rate to be 160. I expect his blood pressure to be 60. Why isn't this happening? Okay, so we talk to them, and of course they have limited funds because it's two in the morning in the ER. So they say, we don't have a lot of money. And we said, okay, that's fine. 
we're going to focus on treating and not diagnosing. So what's the one diagnostic that you want that's not very expensive? PCV, right? So we did it. <laughs> Whoa. Why was this dog's heart rate so low and his blood pressure so high? Because he's pumping strawberry jam through his veins. So that, this is, I don't know that for sure, but that was what I thought. I don't know if anyone's ever done a study on dogs that have a PCV of 82%, but how dehydrated is this dog? A lot. Okay, what concerns you about 82 and 7.2? He's dehydrated, right? 82 is so high, his blood is so thick that he can't even pump it through his veins. What is 7.2? It's pretty normal, right? What happens when we give this dog fluids to make 82 go down to 50? What's going to happen to those solids? They're going to go down to negative 5. So this dog, protein, 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 protein. He has lost all his protein all over his gross diarrhea-filled house, and now he's coming in to see us. So this dog needs fluids. This dog is in hypovolemic shock. This dog is so dehydrated, we're going to treat him with fluids. How much? How quickly? How long is he going to need fluids? These are the questions that we ask when we see these hypovolemic shock patients. What are we going to do with them? How much? How much fluid do we give these guys? A lot, right? You just, especially a Bernie's Mountain Dog, like, well, he can handle a liter, right? Just turn that thing on. Here are blood flow influencers, and here's why we're treating this dog with fluid. So cardiac output, how well does the heart actually function to move blood around the body? What's our heart rate? This is a standard poodle. That's a for real, not double counting heart rate of 274. How is this dog doing with his blood flow? When a heart is going 274 times a minute, it can't even refill before it goes again. So we're having a big problem with our blood flow. Volume status, if you don't have enough fluid, it's not gonna go anywhere because there isn't any to move around. And lastly is vessel resistance. Thinking about a vasodilated patient from heat stroke, thinking about a vasodilated patient from sepsis, that's definitely going to influence the blood flow of this patient. So what's the problem with our Bernie's Mountain Dog? Which one of these is causing his biggest issue? His volume status, right? His heart rate was okay. I'm gonna say volume status and blood viscosity. So how are we gonna fix volume status in this dog? Fluids. This is where we get shock doses of fluids. So in dogs, 90 mils per kg, that's about one blood volume for that dog. So when we say give him a shock dose, 90 mils per kg in dogs, about 55 per mils per kg in a cat. How many of you guys have ever bolus 55 mils per kg in a cat? Okay, woo, brave. Cats hate us, like to dump fluid into their chest. Most of the time we're not gonna give all 90 mils or all 55 mils to our patient. This is why I love shock, because the doctor will say, bolus that dog 20 mils per kg, and then recheck his vitals, and then they leave the room. And I love it when they leave the room, because now I'm in charge. So we're gonna divide those doses out. We're gonna say, this is a 35 kilogram dog, he's gonna get 20 mils per kg, 700 mils, right off the bat, and you're gonna squeeze it in. Okay, this is a case where you're going to throw all your scrub in the sink. You don't even have time to go to the garbage. All right, I'm important. I'm going to squeeze this blood in. Bolus, that's what it means. A true bolus is squeezed in as fast as you can possibly make it go. It doesn't mean put it on a, syringe or a fluid pump and hit 999. It means squeeze it in. Okay? Then look at what their vital signs are. So this dog comes in with a heart rate of 130. After we give him fluids, what do you think is going to happen to that heart rate? I expect it to go up. In a, in a shock patient who comes in with a heart rate of 170, we wanna see that come down. I wanna see that there's more fluid circulating and the heart says, okay, I can kind of relax a little bit. But in this dog, as we make his blood thinner and his body realizes how sick it is, I think his heart rate's gonna go up. That's gonna tell us that things are going better with this patient. So give a bolus, check your vital signs. Don't walk back to your doctor and go, okay, I gave his bolus, what do you want me to do? Go back to your doctor and say, I gave his bolus. His heart rate's 140, his blood pressure is 127, his gums look less gross and gray than they did, his mentation looks a little bit better, and I think his pulses are improving. What do you want me to do? 
that's a great technician. Don't just say, I'm done, what's next? Say, I measured all his vital signs, what are we doing next? And let's say, repeat. And you repeat, and you repeat, and you repeat until your vital signs are what you want them to be. Crystalloid fluids only stay in the intervascular space for about 30 minutes. So we're just gonna keep on pouring them in until we see a good heart rate, we see a good blood pressure, we see pink gums, we see normal pulses. We're feeling good about this patient. Cats. <laughs> what do cats do when they're in shock? They get super cold, right? I mean, they just try to die because that's what cats do anyway. <laughs> Cats are different than dogs. I finally learned that after almost 20 years, cats are different than dogs. So with cats, warm them up. Cats vasodilate, they don't vasoconstrict. Dogs understand the rules, cats do not, so they vasodilate. <coughs> if we take a giant floppy blood, blood vessel in a cat that has no blood pressure and we fill it with fluids, and we, now we have a cat whose temperature is 91 degrees but they have a blood pressure of 80, what's gonna happen as that cat warms up? What happens to those blood vessels? they get smaller, they shrink down to normal size. So now we have this much fluid in a vessel that's this size. What do cats do with that fluid? Lungs, bye-bye. Okay, so be careful with cats. Know the cause of your shock. If you know that that cat has not eaten for three or four days, he can probably handle some more fluids. If you don't know what happened to that cat, we're gonna be a little bit more conservative until we get that cat warmed up and we can better determine his fluid needs. What if that's a chihuahua that comes in with a really high heart rate and a really low blood pressure and gray gums and terrible pulses? What if he has heart failure? What if his reason for problems is that his cardiac output is terrible? Are we gonna fill that dog with fluids and make him better? No, okay? So be careful, every dog except your cardiac patients are going to be treated with fluids. All of our cats are gonna be treated by warming them up and being judicious with our fluids and just really closely monitoring their vital signs. What are your nursing concerns with this big doofus who's feeling better now? Oh, he's so cute. What are you worried about? What are we gonna be monitoring in this guy? Protein levels, yeah, where's that fluid going? I'm looking for edema, I'm looking for fluid dripping from his nose, I'm looking to make sure that hopefully he's breathing okay, that he hasn't dumped a bunch of fluid into his chest. What else are we looking for? Who's putting a tail wrap on this dog? <laughs> yeah, who's pouring diarrhea? Cleanliness is huge, all right? Look better, feel better. If this beautiful, fancy pants Bernie's Mountain Dog is covered in diarrhea, he's gonna be miserable, okay? Clean him up, that's a big important thing. What else are we looking for? Nutrition, right? He ate the ham sandwich the day before, he's fine. He's losing all of that protein, so how are we gonna replace it? The best way to replace protein is by nutrition. I'm not saying that we need to start force feeding this dog right now, but we need to start the clock ticking on this guy hasn't had much food, his protein levels are low coming in the door, we might need to be a little bit more aggressive with nutrition with him than we would with another patient. What's his blood pressure? What's his perfusion? How do we measure perfusion in our patients? CRT, mucous membrane color, heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, PCV, lactate, urine output, urine-specific gravity, <laughs> so many ways we can measure perfusion, and we should be looking at as many of those as we possibly can. I'm not saying you're gonna measure a PCV total protein on this animal every four hours, but you really should be feeling for pulses, looking at their gum color, measuring what their blood pressure is, feeling for those pulses. Fluids, this dog was on 30 mils per kg of crystalloid fluids for hours. I had technicians coming up to me going, I, um, what, do you know what we're doing with this dog? Like, yeah, where are all of his fluids going? He's pouring diarrhea. How do we monitor this guy for fluid overload? It's okay to be worried and think your doctors are crazy because we're going through a liter an hour of fluids on this dog. But be, okay, this is what we're doing, so now I'm gonna monitor this dog for having problems. I'm gonna pay attention to his respiratory rate, I'm gonna pay attention to his body weight, I'm gonna pay attention to his urine. Is he urinating? We had this dog on a liter an hour and he didn't urinate for 12 hours. Where are his fluids going? Into his GI tract, disappearing. So keep track of those things. PCV monitoring, talked a little bit about nutrition. Lastly, <laughs> Oh, front row said it all. Oh, no, like, so we put a little ECG on. How many of you guys are concerned? Couple? It's okay. 
Heart rate's about 90. Oh, I like you. You can come work with me. <laughs> Treat the patient, not the machine. This is scary. What is that called? Those little blips in there, these little guys. VPCs, ventricular premature contractions. Why are they happening in this dog? Reperfusion injury? Probably. So, I mentioned it just a tiny bit. This dog, not circulating blood very well, has blood that looks like strawberry jam, not getting it all out to all of the cells that need it. When cells don't get blood flow, they don't get oxygen. When they don't get oxygen, they start to die. Oxygen is really important in energy production. It's really important to be able to maintain cellular membranes. We start to get oxygen-free radicals that are produced because there's not enough oxygen in there and the body's going, mm, what am I gonna do to stay alive? So we bring this dog in, we slam him with a bunch of fluids, we get his perfusion to improve, and the blood goes out and it picks up all of that junk that's been sitting out there in the periphery, and it brings it all back and just circulates it all over the body. And the heart sometimes can get a little irritated at that, and we can see some VPCs. So when you have a patient who comes in in severe shock, maybe monitor and see what their ECG is a few hours after you've done fluid resuscitation. If you don't have continuous ECG monitoring, that's okay. But every time you go to that patient, put your stethoscope on their heart, put your fingers on their femoral artery. You should hear and feel the same amount of beats. If you don't, get your ECG out and look, does this patient have an arrhythmia? So, are you worried about this patient? Now, who's worried about this patient? I'm still a little worried, it's okay, but I'm not worried that his heart's gonna stop. I can look at that and say, okay, this dog came to us, he was in severe shock, he was hypoperfused, now we've reperfused him, I see a couple VPCs, go back to your patient. Treat the patient, not the machine. What's his heart rate? Oh, that's pretty good. Heart rate of about 90, I'm okay with. What's his blood pressure? What's his gum color? What's his capillary refill time? Does he respond to his name? Does he wanna get up and go outside? If all of those things are okay, I'm okay. If I go over to him and his gums are white and he doesn't want to get up and I'm poking him and he doesn't respond, I'm worried about this dog, regardless of what his ECG looks like. So go back, reassess your patient, write this down in your treatment sheet, noted VPCs, go to your doctor, hey, I noted VPCs, but heart rate's this, blood pressure's this, gum color's this, what do you want me to do? And they'll probably say, keep monitoring. But bring them all that information. Don't just go running down the hallway. Ah, VPCs. Go back to your patient. Report the whole story. Frequent monitoring of these guys. Heart rate, mucous membrane color, capillary refill time, urine output, urine specific gravity, mentation, blood pressure. Keep going back to your basics. There's nothing super groundbreaking about these guys. Just go back monitor all of their vitals and report those back to get your next step.